the yield on cost has to be higher than, than, a, than a going cap rate in a market in order for the development to make sense because it's a pain in the ass to dig a hole in the ground and build something, right? So it better be accretive to, to the investors and the operator to actually make that, that work. Our deals, our PSAs, to the extent we can, we try to put in all government approvals have to be done before we're obligated to buy the property. Because now we can build what we want to build. We have full permits. We're ready to go. It saves on time. And there's no, there's not, there's little money at risk. I'd say permitting money is at risk because we pay for permits and studies and things like that. Welcome back to Passive Income Pilots, everyone. Tate Durier and Ryan Gibson here bringing you another Thursday one-on-one. -on -one. How you doing, Ryan? I'm doing great. I'm excited about today's topic. Me too. So we talk a lot about, we're going to dive right into this here. We talk a lot about different asset classes within commercial real estate and you know, the whole spectrum of you know, self-storage, like Ryan's in, multifamily, mobile home parks, office, which you probably want to stay away from right now, hospitality, <laughs> um, all these different uh, industrial, all these different asset classes that are sort of under the umbrella of commercial real estate. And then within each one of those, there is the risk spectrum. So you can go from a core property all the way up to a development property in each one of these. What we mean by that is the lowest risk, lowest return investments on any of these things are buying stabilized properties that have already been improved. You're basically just buying a, a cash clip. There's very little to no execution risk because you're really not doing anything. You're just buying the property and letting it sit there. There is no entitlement risk. There's no permitting risk. You're buying an existing asset that produces cash flow, right? That's core. Then there's value add, maybe some uh, value add plus, and then uh, finally development, which is buying something where it's just dirt and you're building it from the ground up. That typically involves the most amount of risk, but it also can involve the highest level of returns. So something we want to talk about today is yield on cost and what that metric means and how it relates to cap rate. If you're familiar with cap rate of buying an existing asset and analyzing how much cash that asset produces versus the purchase price, which is the cap rate, right? Well, how do we analyze, how do we compare it apples to apples when we're talking about a development project that doesn't have any cash flow, but has a you know, a projected exit. So Ryan, I'm gonna turn this over to you and you've been doing a ton of development with Spartan over the last few years. Let's talk about yield on cost. Yeah, so for, first of all, two things. Ground up development can produce some of the best right. returns. And secondly, if you're evaluating an, a, a ground up development as an opportunity as a limited partner, the first thing you should be concerned about is what is my yield on cost? That's your first question. And we're going to unpack exactly what that means on this episode. So for those uh, investors that invest in commercial real estate, they're very familiar with cap rate. And cap rate is just as a percentage of what the investment is going to produce from cash flow. That's it. Unlevered, what the property revenue minus expenses is going to be. That's your net income. And you divide that by the purchase price. And that's what cap rate is okay and we talk about this in other episodes if you're not sure sure what cap rate is we're sort of in the 102 class so go back to the right. 101 class <laughs> and look up cap rate so yield on cost is really just a cap rate based on your basis in the property so what i mean by that is let's just say you're going to build something from the ground up here's some follow-on questions so so you go to a developer and you say okay you're building these multi-family apartments you're building a mobile home park. You're building a self-storage facility. What is your yield on cost? And what we like to see at Spartan is a 9% to an 11% yield on cost. Ideally, it's double digits. And the higher yield on cost, the better. That basically means that your projections are showing that your yield based on your cost is, uh, is very good. So... What does this really mean? So when I say cost, I mean that is the cost of the land, that is the cost of construction, that's the cost of any fees associated with the project, that's a cost of leasing up your property. Like you don't just build 300 units and then they all lease up the next day. You're gonna lose money 
while you're leasing up those units. So it's the, it's the operational loss coverage and the lease up losses that you're going to experience getting to your stabilization, which probably is 85 to 90% occupancy, right? Where the asset has basically filled up. Now, you're going to look at what the stabilized net income is when you get the property completely leased up, and you're going to divide that by what your basis in the property is or how much you spend to get there. Make sense? So let's just say there is a self-storage facility. We're going to use that because that's what we do. And let's say it's a 100,000 or it's a yeah, 100,000 square foot facility and you can buy it for $20 million. And you look at the income that it's producing and you see that the NOI is $1 million annually for the investment. So you would take 1 million divide that by 20 million 5%. and what is your cap rate? Taking 5%, right? So you take 1 million net income divided by $20 million purchase price, you have a 5% cap rate. That's what you're buying that property for. So if you bought it all cash, you would be earning a 5% coupon on that investment. Now, let's just say that's an existing property, right? That's how you determine the cap rate. Now let's look at what it would take to build the same facility in today's market. And so if I, if I come to you and say, hey, I got this great ground up development project in this market, we're gonna build a 100,000 square foot facility and when it's leased up, it'll be a million dollars a year of net income. Well, let's just say that it costs me $10 million to get there. So that's the land purchase, the construction costs, the losses, the lease up, everything that goes involved in that project, I'm going to pile onto a cost. And when you look at the investment perspective, you're going to want to ask for resources and uses. And that's basically going to say how much cash is required to do this deal and where is it going to be used? And there's going to be a total amount that balances out. Sources should equal uses always. <laughs> and that cash is going to tell you what their total project cost is. And so if it was $10 million, you simply take the million dollars of stabilized income and you divide that by your basis, which is $10 million. So what is your yield on cost? 10%. Case. Yeah, so now you can actually in ground up, you can build something from the ground up for almost half of what it costs to buy it existing. Even when you consider all of the losses that you could expect to incur along the way. So what is your spread there? Your spread is $10 million, right? So that's how you build $10 million of value. And at Spartan, we've done this over and over and over again. Uh, specifically, we built a mobile home park actually in 2020, actually <laughs> March of 2020 is actually when we closed. So it was a fun time. We built it during COVID. And our total cost was around 10 million and somebody paid us 25 million uh, for the asset. Maybe I think it was actually closer to 11 million or something like that. But our yield on cost was very good because the buyer at the end recognized the value of the facility when it was stabilized and was willing to pay what they were willing to pay because of the economics. So anyway, the, the whole point here is when you're looking at multi, you know, we're looking at ground up development, doesn't matter what asset class, yield on cost is a very important understanding of how much value is created in what the investor is well, proposing to build. Well, and I think that when you, so. when you exit, when you take a property through the lease up phase and you've got it stabilized and then you're going to sell it, that commercial real estate always trades on cap rate, right? So the going cap rate, if the going cap rate is 5% and you look at a development deal and the yield on cost is 4%, well, that's not a good deal, right? Because, because it's going to no, cost it's you <laughs> more to build it than you're going to get on sale. Right, so the yield on cost has to be higher than than a, than a going cap rate in a market in order for the development to make sense because it's a pain in the ass to dig a hole in the ground and build something. Right, so it better be accretive to yeah. to the investors and the operator to actually make that that work. So, what are some ways that you know an investor, if they're they're looking at a development deal, can look at yield on cost and unpack whether it's reasonable or not? You know, whether, whether it says yield yeah, on cost I is 7.2%. <laughs> okay. How do we, how do we know whether those, that, that number's any good? Well, if you're looking at a 7% uh, 
if it starts with a seven or even starts with an eight right now, I wouldn't do the deal. Um, you know, and if the invest, if the operator doesn't know what their yield on cost is, I'd probably run the other way or, or explain to them what yield to cost is. And then, and then maybe they have the answer and that's okay too. So I, I, a couple of things, right? So let's say you're building a hundred thousand square foot self-storage facility. Well, you've got to look at how long is the operator expecting to take to lease that property. And if it's less than three years, then I would run the other way, right? So these are the calculations, right? So if you, on a facility that big, I would make sure that the operator has planned it for three years of, of budget to get that property to stabilization. That's how long it's gonna take. Now, they could get to break even maybe in a year and a half or two years, whatever it might be. But I would, I would say, you know, hey, when are you expecting to go from zero to, you know, fully stabilized? That's going to take about three years. Um, now, I would look at what is the assumed interest rate, right? So like, let's say there's a loan and they're borrowing $10 million and the interest rate is six and a half percent on that loan, which is typical for, for today's market. I would say, okay, well, they're going to have loan payments that they won't be able to cover for a period of time while they're going through stabilization. So I would look at that calculation and make sure that, okay, how many months are they gonna have to cover down on the loan? And have they carried enough operational um, or lease up losses, interest, interest expense losses um, to get to that? So like, for example, we're gonna talk actually next week about assessing a risk on a deal on our next episode. We're gonna bring in actually a general contractor, commercial general contractor that builds uh, for all of Spartan's projects and all of our other ones. And we're gonna talk about risk. But in that particular project, we've budgeted $1.1 million of losses because it's a 75,000 square foot property. We're assuming that it's gonna take us three years to lease it to stabilization. And we know we're gonna lose money. And there's two ways you lose money during a lease up. One, you've got to pay your employees, property taxes, insurance, uh, all the things that go into running your property, landscaping, utilities, any maintenance that pops up. I mean, it should be a brand new property, but those are your operational losses. But that's kind of like your assume no debt losses, right? There's no debt on the property. Those are your operational losses. But then in addition to that, you have interest loss losses when you put that loan on there because you won't be able to make loan payment. Um, you won't be able to cover the loan payments with the income that you have when you have no customers, right? So that's one thing that I would make sure, like make sure that that operator say, the next question is, is how long do you assume that this property is going to take to lease up? That would be my number one question. And then I would walk through the financials to make sure that they're carrying enough lease up losses. I like it. The second thing. Yeah. The second thing I would look at is what are you assuming for construction cost? Right? So, you know, how do you know it's going to cost you what it's going to cost you in that market and then stress test construction cost. So if the operator is saying $80 a foot, well, what if it ends up being 110 or $120 a foot? Will that break the, the, the project? And what will that do to yield the cost? Um, that's another thing to kind of stress test in your underwriting. The third thing I'd look at is their feasibility study. You know, how many operate, how many facilities are around that property? How, how full are they? What are their rents? Right? Because we like to look in markets where the rents are at least $17 to $18 a foot or, or greater. If they're at 12 or 11 for self-storage, you're probably not going to be able to decrease your rents to get your lease up going. And part of this analysis is you want to make sure that the operator is discounting their lease up rents, right? You're not going to go to market at 100% rents. You're going to go to market at a 30 or 40 or 50 percent discount because you want to get your customers in the there's the next door. thing I was going to mention was concessions. Lost so there's going to be what's right? called exactly lost to lease is just a simple way of what is it going to cost me to get my customer that's going to be full paying right like that's a you're going to have that you're going to have marketing and promotion so those are kind of the three main things I, I'm sure Tate there's probably more that you can think of but um, when I'm you know I evaluate deals all the time you know I sit on the Spartan uh, investor committee. Deals are pitched to me, and when I look at them, these are all the these are all the things I'm looking for. As I'm saying, how, what's the market like? What are the rents like? What are the demographics like? How is the property positioned on the road? Can you see the property w really well? Does it have good access? Does it have good visibility? Is there a lot of linear feet, at least 200 feet ideally, 
across a main road so people can actually see the property when they're driving by. I look at yield to cost. And then I just kind of, um, I look at the basis and kind of the sweet spot for us is our land is typically a million to two million bucks fully unentitled when we put it under contract. Then we fully entitle it and get all the building permits in place before we actually close on the property. And so that'll be addressed in the purchase and sales agreement. So that's another way of assessing risk is, you know, you may buy property and it's zoned for self-storage, but it doesn't mean you can build right. self-storage. It just means it's zoned for self-storage. You still have to get it fully improved with easements and restrictions and all that. So I would want to make sure that all government approvals were out of the way before you actually closed on the property. And that mitigates That's an excellent point risk. because I have been in development deals that went sideways because of uh, permitting. And uh, so it's not a fun ride to be on as an investor if you're, if you are, you know, you're, returns are riding on whether something gets approved or not. Um, well, let's take this. Yeah. And I and actually, yeah. yeah, no, it's real, real quick, Tate. I, I do want to hammer on that a little bit. Um, people, development deals have kind of a stigma around them as being really risky and they are, but it depends because you, you you know, your deal, I know your example, the one in Hawaii, like they didn't have entitlements before they bought that property. That is the most risky investing you can do. It's like it's like saying, "Hey, I'm going to buy this single family right. home, but I don't even know if I can rent it out or not." That's like that right that's crazy, right? So so some sometimes you're in a hot market and you sort of have to take that risk, but know if you're investing in that risk, right? Our deals are PSAs to the extent we can. We try to put in all government approvals have to be done before we're obligated to buy the property. Because now we can build what we want to build. We have full permits, we're ready to go, it saves on time. And there's no, there's not, there's little money at risk. I'd say permitting money is at risk because we pay for permits and studies and things like that. But we're not paying millions of dollars for the land and then obligating ourselves to land that we can't build what we want to build on it, right? So I would say that is hugely important in your DD process as well. So sorry. No, I, know you I mean, there's, there's else, all but. sorts of stuff we could talk about in terms of entitlement and construction costs you know we have we just did two different deals one where we do not participate in the creation of a public facilities corporation which is a tax abatement deal uh, the investors are not participating in that risk if that falls through the deal falls apart the investors get their money back um, you know we're not taking on that risk which is something that we you know we look for we had another deal where we had a gmax contract where it's a guaranteed maximum contractor said we guarantee that that we'll do it for this price and if we go over the contractor has to eat the overrun uh so it's it's those those kinds of things that are very very beneficial for investors that uh, they're not they're not going to get into a deal particularly a development deal that uh, has a bunch of cost overruns and and has issues leasing up Yeah, and actually on our next episode, we dive deep into guaranteed max price contracts. Uh, that's pretty typical. Lenders really not going to lend on a big commercial job unless if it's got a doesn't have a GMAX price. But there's some stipulations to GMAX that you have to understand, which is the suppliers, until those building materials are delivered and purchased and on your property, you're subject to changes in cost. So let's just say you're ordering a bunch of metal. This happened to me during COVID personally on one of our projects where my contractor called me and said, hey, if you don't order this metal today, prices are going to go up a million dollars for your job. And I was like, put the order in. He's like, we'll figure it out. <laughs> we just got to get it here, lay it down on the property, cover it up or whatever. Because there's, they're, and they're not obligated, right? Like no contractor would sign up for a $100 million job and be screwed because the supplier now raises their prices and no supplier is going to commit to a price necessarily until it's full full and delivered, right? Prices fluctuate. So now the labor and the bid of the contractor is guaranteed max price, but there's stipulations mm -hmm. there. So you really, there's still risk, right? And that's, I think that the point is like, you can mitigate risk, but you, there's still going to be risk on these types of investments. Um, well, so you just excited to, to talk where risk to, where mitigation so. in developments next week, but hopefully this uh, is a good intro to yield on cost and how it relates to cap rate. Ryan, thanks again, and uh, we'll see you next week. See you guys.